That's where 80% of all communications from Asia enter the United States. But under NSA's new orders, they don't tap in here. Instead, the cables run straight from San Luis Obispo to a building in San Francisco. The building at 611 Folsom Street is AT&T's regional switching center. All the international traffic snakes up to the seventh floor. And it is here that a crucial change takes place. The seventh floor is also where AT&T's domestic traffic is routed. A cacophony of millions of conversations. Cries and laughter, hopes and dreams, emails, faxes, bank statements, hotel reservations, love poems, and death notices. All sent by people from inside the United States. The only thing they have in common is a reasonable expectation of privacy. In 2003, an AT&T engineer notices that the cables on the seventh floor have been rerouted and a mirror image of all the traffic, both domestic and international, is now being sent to a secret room one floor below. It was obvious that this was some kind of NSA installation. I figured out that what they were doing was a blind wholesale copying of the entire internet data flow. And this meant randomly scooping up huge amounts of purely domestic data as well as international data. When I hear the word wiretap, I've always imagined some person in a trench coat and a black hat and sunglasses skulking around after dark, secretly tapping into a wire and hoping that no one notices. But what they've done in that facility is by full light of day, they've cut the fiber optic cables and then reconnected them in a splitter what they have built is a facility that is capable of monitoring absolutely all data communication through it. Brian Reed, a communications expert, has examined AT&T's internal documents that Klein provided. They show that the secret room contains electronic equipment specifically designed for signals intelligence. Equipment programmed to sift through millions of messages, searching for keywords like the ones Bamford sent from Kuala Lumpur. The most curious piece of equipment in that room is a completely flexible monitoring system that can be told on a moment's notice. Please monitor all conversation that contains the word hummingbird. Please monitor all conversation that goes to Mobile, Alabama. Please monitor all conversations that contain both the word hummingbird and go to Mobile, Alabama. NSA has turned its giant ear to listen in on America. Based on everything I know, I believe that there are between 15 and 30 of these secret rooms around the US. The post 9-11 rules authorized NSA to listen in to Americans both inside and outside the US without any special court approval. 9-11, we were essentially put in charge of a new system which intercepted satellite phone communications in Iraq and Afghanistan and surrounding areas. Calls and data from the Middle East and North Africa are collected and relayed to a listening post tucked in the hills outside Augusta, Georgia. As a voice interceptor, Adrian Kinney listened to some of those calls. Assigned by the Army to NSA, she was called back to active duty after 9-11. For a voice interceptor, the computer system would essentially pop up, and it would be very similar, I would say, to iTunes, where you could just go through and click on various conversations, and it would have the phone number, the time up, time down. We were told that we were to listen to all conversations that were intercepted, to include those of Americans and other ally countries. Some of those conversations are personal, some even intimate. And there was no directive to say that when you had conversations like this come through that 
you should delete them. Um, that's what we did when I was on active duty in um, 94 to 98. Um, we would never collect on an American. And, uh, I, don't know. I had a real problem with the fact that people were listening to it and that I was listening to it. By the time that that interceptor, that voice interceptor is spending listening to conversations in the States, that's time that they can't spend looking or listening for um, actual conversations related to terrorist organizations. As NSA began tapping into fiber optic cables as well as satellites, information began to flood in like never before. According to a congressional study in 2008, some intelligence data sources grow at a rate of four petabytes. That's four quadrillion bytes per month. The equivalent of 12 filing cabinets of new information for every American citizen every year. But what does it all mean? Computers today tell people what things are. Here's some data that you asked for. They don't tell you what it means. So there is some work going on to try to marry the power of computers to the power of humans. Specialized software can help extract important information based on context and meaning. Dr. Robert L. Pop does advanced research on these kinds of programs, known as classifiers. Say you wanted to build a classifier for Al-Qaeda, the term, the concept Al-Qaeda. The way it would work is you as an analyst would go find all these documents, whether they're emails or things on the web or whatever, but all these documents that in your judgment are narratives associated with the concept of Al-Qaeda. In the future, by refining the software and harnessing enough computing power, these classifiers could potentially reduce the mountain of information human analysts have to examine. So the next frontier may be computer. Do you see any unusual associations that I didn't think to ask you about that I ought to have asked you about when it relates to a threat against the homeland? But most experts agree that may take decades, and it could only help mine information in documents, emails, and faxes. When it comes to human conversations, technology is of little help. It still takes people wearing headphones and listening in. I decided a, a couple weeks after 9-11 to enlist and uh, go to Arabic and I uh, hoped to go hunt Osama at that time. David Murphy Falk was one of the thousands of new linguists trained to work in the trenches of NSA's signals intelligence operations. NSA spends literally billions of dollars to obtain signals, to process them, move them from place to place without people knowing, to uh, get them to an end user, a translator, who can make some sense of them and, and write up a, 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 a transcription. What I found was a large number of translators simply not meeting minimal requirements in language skills, uh, basically running some very expensive, very complicated equipment without the kind of knowledge or context that they would need to do that properly. Before 9-11, the budget for U.S. intelligence was $26.7 billion. By 2008, that budget nearly doubled. NSA's portion is secret, but believed to be over a third. More than the departments of Treasury, Interior, or Labor. Its ranks have swelled to over 35,000. Given all the additional money spent now on rebuilding the intelligence community and its capabilities, are we really safer as a nation? I think generally for me the answer is yes. The fact that we haven't had another attack, the fact that we have better coordination and better information sharing 
are we to the point where we can relax and, and, and keep put our guard down? No. I think if we do, then we run the risk of changing the answer. It's very, very hard to draw a hard and fast line between where foreign intelligence stops and domestic intelligence starts. That doesn't mean that we want our foreign intelligence agencies on every street corner in America, but it does mean that you have to have very good communication and coordination between the foreign intelligence agencies like the CIA and NSA and our domestic agencies like the FBI. Because if you don't, things are going to slip between the cracks, and that's exactly what happened with 9-11. The problem with reporting on a story like this is that you're really searching in the dark. There's no way to sit on the outside and really know what's going on on the inside. And without an official inquiry, some questions can't be answered. Why did the NSA fail to act or pass on information that could have warned of 9-11? Why didn't it share information with the CIA and FBI that could possibly have stopped the plot? As for the question of whether we are any safer now than we were before, we should have been safe the way it was. NSA had all the information it needed to stop the hijackers, and it already had laws that allowed it to trap them. So now with NSA's new rules, with all the money it spent, with all the data it collects, is NSA doing a better job? Or is this job that much harder because it's just being flooded with data? How much information is enough? And won't too much information end up making the world more dangerous?